when it's time now for perspective. The prevailing theories about the origins of World War II tend to focus on things like the crippling economic impact for Germany of the Treaty of Versailles or the cult of personality that cast Adolf Hitler as Germany's saviour. You're far less likely to see the 20th century's most devastating conflict discussed in the context of imperial ambition. But that's exactly what my guest today is seeking to do with his latest book, Blood and Ruins, The Great Imperial War of 1931 to 1945. Richard Overy, historian and author, thank you so much for speaking to us on France 24 today. Now, most children learned that World War II began in 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. But your book, as we just said, begins in 1931. Why is that? Well, it's because I, I see the Second World War in the context of a broader global pattern of imperialism, which goes back to the 19th century. Uh, and in the 1930s, Japan, Italy and Germany, all of them separately decided that they wanted to build a larger territorial empire like the British and the French Empire and so on. And somehow or other, they deserved it. Uh, and this was the way in which the world was going to develop. It was a kind of geopolitical fantasy. But in 1931, Japan launched that program with the occupation of Manchuria, and it went on step by step through the 1930s. So I'm trying to see the Second World War cast in a much broader context than simply 1939 stopping Hitler. And what then was it specifically about Germany at this point in the, in the early mid-30s that made it uh, you know, the, the candidate for uh, leading this imperial expansionism uh, across Europe. What was it about Germany specifically? Well, the, the problem with Germany was that in 1919, Germany lost its empire in the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and that created a, 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 a well of bitterness in Germany that, that all the other powers had empires, even little states like the Netherlands or Belgium, but they didn't. Uh, now, that might not have led anywhere had it not been for Hitler, because Hitler was dedicated to the idea that Germany would only become great if it had a large territorial empire, and it would carve that territorial empire out of Eastern Europe. So the critical thing, of course, was the appointment of Hitler in 1933. Uh, but we need to remember that, as I said, that, that Japan has already begun to embark on a massive imperial drive into China, and Mussolini in Italy is already thinking about carving out an empire in the Mediterranean. So, so Hitler is one of a trio. He's not just on his own. And you write at length about uh, the moral justification of the war uh, from the side of the Allies. Uh, but you argue that any claim the Allies were principally trying to uh, protect democracy, human rights. You argue that that uh, is actually a rather problematic way to see things. It is rather problematic. Um, of course, in the end, uh, you know, we should all be glad that fascist Italy, you know, Nazi Germany and militaristic Japan were defeated. Uh, but the idea that this was a good war, that the Allies waged their war uh, uh, on just lines, does need some modification. In wartime, morality is relative, and that was certainly true in the Second World War. Uh, a state like the United States claiming to be fighting on the side of freedom and democracy is still able to drop an atomic bomb on an open city uh, and kill 80,000 people at a stroke. So we, we need to be clear that to win total war, even the Allies sometimes had to adopt positions that we might regard as morally questionable. And you write about, uh, of course, just how bloody uh, these numerous imperial projects uh, were. Does imperialist expansionism in the 20th and 19th century necessarily entail human suffering? I'm afraid it does. Uh, I know that there's a, there's a move underfoot to try to rehabilitate uh, some of this imperialism. And in Britain, there's a very sentimental view now of empire. But at the end of the day, empire is about reducing people to subject status, uh, removing their sovereignty, uh, and, of course, exploiting economically the resources that are now available. And sometimes, or indeed often, that involved violence, whether it was the British or the French empires, or whether it was later on the German, Italian and Japanese empires. Imperialism from its nature is, is an oppressive authoritarian form of government. And I think we need to be honest about that for all the powers involved. Which leads me on to my next question. How does Hitler's persecution of the Jews specifically fit into this idea that Germany's ambitions were imperialist in nature? 
the the genocide of you know the Jewish people. Where does that fit into the imperialist project? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, throughout the book, in fact, uh, I've woven the, the history of the Holocaust because it seems to me that the history of the Holocaust and the history of the war uh, are, are tightly intertwined. They're not separate histories. And the problem is that that Hitler chose to occupy that part of Eastern Europe and Western Soviet Union, where most of Europe's Jews lived. Now, Hitler wanted this to be German imperial colonial space. He didn't want it to be full of Jews. Uh, and he blamed the Jews anyway for what had happened to Germany. But somehow there was a global conspiracy. Uh, and so they would suffer. Uh, and this bizarre way in which Hitler was able to link uh, territorial expansion and nature of the war and his war against the Jews is what made it so deadly. And now your book is titled The Great Imperial War of 1931 to 1945, the implication being that the Great Imperial War came to an end with the end of the Second World War. Did the end of the war, in your opinion, necessarily mean the collapse of global territorial empires? I think it did mark the end. In fact, my book goes on beyond that. It goes on to the early 1960s, but it was difficult to find an end date that really made sense. Um, but in the 20 years after 1945, all the other existing empires unraveled. Uh, most importantly, the British Empire, the fall of India in 1940, the independence of India in 1947, and then you know, on to Algeria. Uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, violence went on throughout the two decades after 1945, but it was a violence that spelt the end of the imperial project. And I think what my book argues is that it was the Second World War and not the First World War that really ended the imperial global order. It was the Second World War that ushered in the age of nation states. And the title of your book is Blood and Ruins. Where did you get the title of your book from? Well, I got it from the um, political scientist Leonard Wolfe, the husband of Virginia Woolf, uh, who wrote a book about imperialism in 1928. And he said, well, what's going to happen? Is it going to go away peacefully or is it going to end in blood and ruins? And it seemed to me to be a very appropriate uh, quotation. Um, I mean, Wolfe believed it would be blood and ruins, and Wolfe was right. Uh, the end of empire was an extraordinary, messy, bloody uh, experience, uh, and it was a global experience. Um, uh, I think that, that Leonard Wolf is one of the neglected intellectuals of the 20th century, but he had a very clear view about what was wrong with imperialism. Richard Overy, uh, fascinating stuff. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Richard Overy, historian and author of Blood and Ruins, thank you so much for speaking to us on France 24 today. Thank you.